Well, let's talk about EQing. So first, if you haven't already, make sure you check out my video on software instruments. I think it's part four. It's earlier in this series of videos. It's around the eight and a half minute mark where I show you how to use the controls of Logic's channel EQ plugin, which is what we're gonna be looking at today. So the link for that is on the screen here above. So check that out. So if I look over here in the inspector on the channel strip that controls the track that has my audio recording on it, I'm going to put an EQ plugin as the first or top plugin on the FX chain. So I could do that by clicking here on the right side of the audio FX slot, and then we'll go down to logic in the drop down menu, and then to the equalizers folder. So there's an easier way to do this. Um, what I'm going to do here is click on this box that says EQ and Logic will automatically put a channel EQ plugin in that first FX slot. So any changes to this EQ, um, you will be able to see them in this little thumbnail view here. And this is just a quick and convenient way to see your EQ settings for a track or a bunch of tracks at a time without having to open up the plugin. So unless you're EQing something where you very specifically want sub low frequencies such as bass or kick drum, you're going to want to cut these out, these really low frequencies, especially in our case here with vocal or spoken word track. Uh, if you have a subwoofer or a really good set of headphones, you're going to hear this rumble going on at different times when you listen back to this recording. We can also turn on our spectrum analyzer here on the plugin by clicking this box. And a spectrum analyzer is going to show us all the different volumes of the different frequencies going on in our recording in real time. So I would definitely recommend turning this on, especially if you don't have a subwoofer. Let's also turn the spectrum analyzer to post so that it interprets the signal after we make changes to the EQ. So let's play this back and we're going to see in here those sub low frequencies again on the far left side uh, starting as low as 20 hertz um, frequencies that are not going to contribute in a good way to this recording the lowest usable bass frequency um, in my voice in this recording are only going to go down to around 80 to 100 hertz so let's play this back two years ago my neighbor bill invited my family and i to lcbc I initially wasn't interested in going, but we decided as a family to check it out one Sunday morning. Let's click this box to turn on what's called a high pass filter. It's also called a low cut filter. And if I position my mouse here, I can drag up to increase the frequency of its cutoff point. We want to make sure again that we're not going to cut too far up um, so it doesn't thin out the vocal too much. So let's just start around, let's say 60 hertz. Bill invited my family and I to LCBC. I initially wasn't interested in going, but we decided as a family to check it out one Sunday morning. All right, that worked pretty well. I'm still hearing two little spots in the audio towards the end of the recording where I'm hearing this little blip of subfrequencies coming through, and I think it might have been because of a plosive that captured some of those low frequencies. Let's see if we can hear those. I initially wasn't interested in going, but we decided as a family to check it out one Sunday morning. So a couple things I can do. Let's um, move the frequency cutoff point a little bit higher. Let's take it up to around 80. And right here, if I position my mouse over this, this is similar to um, if you saw in the, the first video that where I talked about EQs, um, this is similar to the Q. And if I drag down, I can broaden this slope a bit more to allow more of those subfrequencies to come in, or I can tighten it up. Let's move this so it was on 24 dB per octave. Let's try 36. And now let's listen back and see if that helped. Interested in going, but we decided as a family to check it out one Sunday morning. All right, so I think that's sounding pretty good. I really don't think I need to do a whole lot more of EQing to this uh, spoken word recording. Um, with the spoken word recording, you're going to really want it to sound as natural as possible, so very little EQing really is necessary. If this was a vocal recording for a song, um, you're probably going to have to do more EQing to fit it into you know, all the other instruments going on, and you might want it to sound a little bit more processed, so you might add a little bit more high frequencies and do things such as that. I probably could still make a few minor EQ adjustments to this recording. Um, so after you've made your low cut, if you're still hearing something that's not quite right, um, one thing you can do is turn on one of the bell nodes and sweep through the frequencies 
Um, maybe you're hearing a resonance or maybe you're hearing, you know, some kind of offending frequency sweeping through is going to allow you to maybe um, pick that out a little bit more easily than when you find it. You can cut it or you can find, you know, if there's something that needs to be boosted, um, doing this will allow you to find that frequency and then you can boost it from there. Just a word of caution when you're EQing bass frequencies. So bass frequency range between 0 hertz and probably to around 200 hertz. Um, so we already made that low cut to the sub bass region, um, which we did need in this case. Um, but for right now, I'm talking about frequencies between around 80 uh, to around 200. So for most of us, we're mixing in a small square office room with a drop ceiling, or perhaps you're in a bedroom. Um, this type of space and dimensions will usually not represent bass frequencies evenly. Uh, when you play back sound in those types of rooms, some bass frequencies are going to resonate too loudly, and some bass frequency ranges will be too quiet. So you might have some Orlex in there, and that's going to help a little bit with cutting some of the slapback echo and taming some of the highs and mids, but it's not going to do much for taming frequencies from around 300 hertz on down. Okay, so what is the solution? Well, one very simple way, although it's not very scientific and it's only gonna get you a really general idea on how even the bass is in your room, is to sweep a sine wave with the test oscillator that's on an audio track and sweep it through the low frequencies and listen to which bass frequency ranges um, start to get louder and which ones start to get quieter. So that'll give you a really general idea. Um, beyond that, if you wanna do it the proper way, um, you would wanna get a special mic, acoustic analyzer software and you're going to eventually need to potentially set up your room a little bit different and then purchase some more specialized room treatment uh, to take care of the problems. Um, but that's a lot more time and money and it's beyond the scope of this video. So what I would recommend is to really just not boost or cut a lot in this area unless you're really sure that it needs it and you know what you're doing. Um, what I would rely on, especially for spoken word and, and what we've been talking about is just correct recording technique. And you can see some of that in the previous audio audio recording video that I did. All right, let's go back to sweeping through some of these frequency ranges. So I'm going to add 10 dB to this yellow node. Now I don't want to add too much, or otherwise everything I sweep through is going to sound bad. Um, and I don't want too narrow of a Q. Um, around 2.5 here works pretty well. And uh, as I sweep through, let's also not just listen for some areas that may maybe we'd want to cut um, in probably like the mids or the low mids. Um, let's also listen for how the voice has different characteristics um, in the different frequency ranges. So the nasal quality, um, where the, the sibilance is and things like that. So anywhere between, let's say around 100 hertz, and these are just general guidelines here, anywhere between 100 hertz and 200 hertz, you're gonna get boominess. So if you have a uh, recording that's too boomy, you might wanna cut in this area. Hello, my name is John. I live in Lancaster with my wife, Sally, and our three children. I work in construction and have owned my own company for the past. Uh, between 200 and 300, you're gonna get muddiness. So if, if something is too muddy, you might wanna cut in that region. Hello, my name is John. I live in Lancaster with my wife, Sally, and our three children. Anywhere between 300 to 5, 600 hertz is where boxiness re resides. And sometimes you hear, oh, it sounds kind of cardboard-like. Um, you can, a lot of times you're going to cut from this area in voice or even in other instruments uh, to get some of that boxiness out. Just make sure not to cut too much in this area because a lot of the energy um, of a sound is, is around this area as well. Hello, my name is John. I live in Lancaster with my wife, Sally, and our three children. I work in construction and have owned my own company for the past 15... So I might cut there around five, 600 hertz. Uh, moving up from there between you know, 800 and maybe 1200 uh, hertz, you're going to find in the, in the voice uh, the nasal quality. So if something's too nasally, you might want to cut in this area. Hello, my name is John. I live in Lancaster with my wife, Sally, and our three children. I work in construction and if so I might want to cut a little bit there as well to get some of that nasal quality out. Uh, from 1K to th around 3K is where the intelligibility of the voice normally resides. So you actually might be boosting in this area if you're ha having trouble hearing the definition of the voice or if you need some more of the consonants coming through. Consonants a lot of times come around 3K. Hello, my name is John. I live in Lancaster with my wife Sally and our three children. I work in construction and have owned my own company. 
between four kilohertz and around six kilohertz is where your presence is. It's also where your sibilance is. So just be careful with this area. And sibilances, as we know, they come and go. So just, just be aware if you boost in this area, you might be boosting your S's as well. Hello, my name is John. I live in Lancaster with my wife, Sally, and our three children. I work in construction and have, and then from around eight kilohertz on up is where we would say we have the air uh, in, in a recording, especially in a vocal. So if we needed to add more air, I might actually turn this high shelf on, this purple uh, node, and then I might boost from there. About two years ago, my neighbor Bill invited my family and I to LCBC. I initially wasn't interested in going, but we decided as a family to check it out one Sunday morning. So I made some real quick changes. I cut a little bit out at 450 in that boxy area, cut a little bit of 770 in that nasally area. These were just areas and frequencies that I felt like I didn't like. So I just cut a little bit out in those areas and I tightened up the cue um, as well from 2.5 to around 3 or 3.6 here. Um, and then I made a little bit of a boost in the intelligibility area around 2940 hertz and I broadened the cue for that. So very, very minimal changes. I kept them all within a dB. And again, for a spoken word recording, we want this to be organic. We don't want it to sound too processed, but this is just going to give it a little bit of lift, take a little bit of that dull or roomy, boxy sound out of the mic, I feel. So let's just listen back to it. I'm going to play back. Um, I'm going to go back and forth and A, B it between the processed version and the non-processed version. Hello, my name is John. I live in Lancaster with my wife, Sally, and our three children. I work in construction and have owned my own company for the past 15 years. About two years ago, my neighbor Bill invited my family and I to LCBC. I initially wasn't interested in going, but we decided as a family to check it out one Sunday morning. Now I know I've been saying keep it conservative with your EQing, and that's still a case with our spoken word recording. Uh, but depending on things like your mic you're using or some other factors, you might need a bit more EQing, a bit more than one or two dB here or there. Um, and possibly you're gonna need to boost more in the higher frequencies. So in the case of the baptism recordings, you may find that when you play them back on your system in a gathering um, with a bit of the music bed behind them, you, find, you may find that they're not quite cutting through or popping out like you want. So some things that you could do, number one, um, you can find a baptism recording that really sounds good in your gathering room um, that was maybe uh, played the last time you did baptisms. Uh, import that audio file into Logic and try to match the relative EQ of your recordings that you're doing now to that reference recording. Another thing you can do is just take your laptop and your audio interface to your front of house console and sit there with your tech person and just see what works and try some different EQing out. Um, that would be a good use of time with them to find some benchmark sound and a standard for future baptism recordings. So if you need to boost a bit more of the high frequencies, I'd recommend checking out Logic's Vintage EQs for doing this. So you can definitely do this with the channel EQ, but I like the sound of the Vintage EQs for this, for the sweetening of the highs and those high mids, and even some of the lower frequencies as well, uh, if you need to make your voice warmer or fuller sounding, uh, if you need to do that. The Vintage EQs are going to add a bit more of saturation to the sound, um, which is gentle harmonics and excitement to make the sound come forward a bit more and pop a bit more. So just remember a common mistake is going to be to crank the gain of those high frequencies too much and to make your recording too sizzly. So just be careful when you're doing this. So let's take a look at the Vintage EQs. I have all three of them here, Console EQ, Tube EQ, and Graphic EQ. They're all in the EQ folder of the Logic plugins. So I'm still gonna retain my channel EQ, which is giving me my low cut, um, and a few of these little dips in the, the mids, or the low mids. And I can either turn this off or leave this on here. This is not doing a whole lot, one dB, uh, but that's up to you. So let's take a look at Console EQ. And a lot of these controls are gonna be pretty self-explanatory. They're gonna say what they do and their knobs. And here I have a little bit of boost here in the low gain, um, right around 80 some Hertz, which is around that cutoff point of my low cut filter of my channel EQ, just to give a little bit more of body, um, a little bit of warmth to my, my voice. You don't have to do this. Um, I have a little bit of mid gain EQ here at 1.6 dB. 
um, right, and right around that point where the intelligibility of the voice is around three, three kilohertz or so. And I have a little bit of the high gain, a high shelf, um, boosting um, at 2.2 dB. And over here on the right for these Vintage EQ plugins, you're going to find a drive knob, which is going to add some of that saturation to the sound that I talked about. So just doing this very gently, um, not a ton, because this is actually adding distortion to the voice, but not a, not a bad distortion, but a good distortion, very gently, that is going to add the saturation. Let's take a look at the tube EQ. And you can see I'm a little bit more generous here with the high boost on the, the tube EQ. Um, it's, very, it's kind of a very silky sound. It isn't very strident, so you can be a little bit more generous here with your high frequency boost. Um, and again, I have it the high frequency, uh, frequency boost around 2.7 hertz. Um, and the bandwidth is going to be a bit wider. So the higher the number here on the bandwidth, um, the, wi or the wider that Q range is going to be. And you can see some of the other controls as well, um, adding a little bit of low boost and low attenuation. And that's how it works on a Poltec EQ, which is kind of what this is emulating here. Uh, I don't know exactly how this works, but when you boost and you cut a little bit um, of this frequency range, it just sounds good. Adding a little bit of drive, and I'm not doing too much here in this lower range, this lo these lower controls of the EQ. And lastly, we have our graphic EQ which is going to look a lot like our boombox from the 80s. Um, and I just have what we're calling a smile curve. I'll just very gently boosting a little bit more of, of, the, of the lows, just tiny bit, and then boosting some of the high frequencies, two kilohertz, four kilohertz, a little bit of drive. All right, so let's listen to some of the differences in the vintage EQs. I am going to start uh, playing the recording back, and then I'm going to turn on the vintage EQ so you can hear the difference between them. Hello, my name is John. I live in Lancaster with my wife Sally and our three children. I work in construction and have owned my own company for the past 15 years. About two years ago, my neighbor Bill invited my family and I to LCBC. I initially wasn't interested in guns. Hello, my name is John. I live in Lancaster with my wife Sally and our three children. I work in construction and have owned my own company for the past 15 years. About two years ago, my neighbor Bill invited my family and I to LCBC. I initially wasn't interested in going, but we decided as a family... Hello, my name is John. I live in Lancaster with my wife Sally and our three children. I work in construction and have owned my own company for the past 15 years. About two years ago, my neighbor Bill invited my family and I to LCBC. I initially wasn't interested in going, but we decided... Well, hey guys, thanks for watching. Hopefully some of these techniques were helpful. Um, in the next video, we're going to be talking about um, volume control. So region gain, um, compression, and volume automation. So check that out.